Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Petropolis podcast. I have a wonderful guest today. I'm very excited to speak with her, Dr. Judy Morgan. She is a pet advocate. If you don't know Dr. Judy, I don't know where you've been, but uh, she has just completed an educational series called the Cancer Awareness Series on Facebook and Instagram. She has a course um, called the Dog Longevity Made Easy course that is an evergreen course you can find on her site, which I will make sure I post in the show notes. And overall, she is a true pet advocate, veterinarian, and someone that has seen the evolution of the pet food industry over the last 25 years. And she is an expert in this conversation we're going to have. We're going to be talking about really all the stuff that's out there that is about pet health and all the commentary about having that 25-year-old dog, as Rodney Habib's new book, Forever Dog, puts it out there. Is it really that simple in changing diets and making modifications and not feeding processed foods? Because that's what it seems like when you look at it all on the surface. Is it that? What has the food industry become? And where is it headed? Personally, I know I have done everything I possibly can when it comes to natural foods, feeding only a non-processed or minimally processed diet to my dog, Shaq. And he uh, didn't have a long life. He lived to be a little over 13 years old. And... I know I did everything right. Eliminating vaccines, um, chiropractic care, acupuncture, I did everything right. And he didn't live to be 18, 19, 20. He barely made it to 14. So when you have someone like me who has knowledge in pet food and nutrition and um understands quality of life and made sure this dog had everything, weekends at the beach, playing in the water, activity, um, massage, literally everything, quality foods, never vaccinated, titered. When you have someone like me doing that and the dog lives to be barely 14, I wonder, is this hype? What's real? So Dr. Judy is going to talk to us about this dilemma that I'm having because of my own personal experience and many others that I've met who have done everything right, who are as determined to take great care of their pets as I am. Is this all hype? Are these all clickbait articles, people creating an environment where uh, they become experts in something that, yeah, do we need more experts in? I don't know. But Dr. Judy Morgan is going to be answering a lot of questions, and I'm so excited to have her here, have her joining us. Here is Dr. Judy Morgan. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Petropolis podcast. I have an amazing guest here today. I'm grateful to have you, Dr. Judy Morgan. How are you? I am doing so well, and thank you so much for the invitation. I really I really appreciate being able to help educate pet owners wherever they are. You've been doing that for years, <laughs> years. Trying. <laughs> um, I've learned from you, and Good. I continue to learn from you. So, uh, today, I was watching your cancer series that you were doing. It started uh, beginning of the week and people need to listen to you. You have such great information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's start this off. I want to find out 
a little bit about you. When and why did you choose to focus your attention on the practice of holistic veterinary me medicine versus allopathic? I went to a Midwest veterinary school back in the early 80s. So we're going to go traditional, traditional, traditional. And um, like veterinary schools, even now, a lot of our sponsorship was from large pharmaceutical companies, large pet food companies. So that's clearly where everything was focused. Um, about 10 years into practice, my partner and I bought, my veterinary partner uh, bought a clinic and we bought it from a homeopathic practitioner. And the funny thing is that when we bought that clinic, I mean, it was a rundown dump. Um, he was retiring and he really was the butt of all the jokes in the veterinary community because he was practicing voodoo, you know, the black magic medicine. Nobody knew what he was doing. And when clients would come to us from him, they'd have these little envelopes with these little white pill thingies, it, you know, they had names on them that nobody understood. And we didn't know what they were. The clients had no clue. Um, so it was really sort of the butt of the joke. Well, after we bought the practice, I sort of accidentally took a chiropractic course that story is in the Needles to Natural book. Um, and the changes, I started using it because, you know, I took the course. So I started using it. And the changes that I saw in my patients were, were nothing short of miraculous. But you started <laughs> using the chiropractic, the chiropractics in your practice. Okay. That was, yeah, that was the first holistic modality that I learned. Okay. And, um, you know, at the time, I wasn't very good at it. And I was still getting amazing results. So I thought, well, what else is out there? Like, all of a sudden, my brain had to get rewired. So I just started studying everything I could. And everything that I learned, I started using. And then it just became, wow, I've got all these tools in my toolbox. Like, I don't have to rely on just this one thing. Um, and after... After about 10 years of that, my business partner said, I don't know what it is about that building because I worked most of the time in the voodoo building. He's like, I don't know what it is about that building, but you have taken on the voodoo and the black magic and I just can't be a part of this. And I said, okay. And we parted ways as friends. His practice was five and a half miles up the road from my practice. And so clients, a lot of them went back and forth between the two. I think that eventually I ended up with a lot more of the clients who um, were really interested in using more holistic treatments or integrative treatments. So, um, you know, it was fine. We're still friends to this day. Um, but that's kind of how it all got started. And I, for me, it was just the changes in the patients were so dramatic. And then being able to be more preventive and proactive, which is um, a lot of the education that I do now is being more proactive so that we're not sitting there with a 12 year old animal with six chronic diseases, which might include cancer, uh, a, a laundry list of medications. We, we'd rather cut that off at the pass early on. Wow. Did you ever incorporate homeopathy into your, in, into your practice or was that something you left? Cause you know, those little white pellets in the nineties, I worked with a holistic, with a homeopathic vet only. Yeah. And so people thought uh, I was crazy then. Well, interestingly, the uh, building that that the voodoo practice was in was a converted little tiny barn. And the person who originally lived in the house that went with the little tiny barn uh she was a third generation homeopath wow so you know it yes it was the voodoo property so when i started doing the chiropractic and i was talking to her and i and she was had a ton of cats and she treated them all with homeopathy mm -hmm. um when i said that i wanted to learn other modalities she brought me i don't know about 75 cassette tapes this was back in the days of cassettes cassette tapes that were Richard Pitcairn's mm -hmm. complete homeopathy course on yep. all, and all the workbooks and notebooks and all this stuff. And I just looked at it and went, oh my gosh, this is a lot of information. So I started listening to the tapes. I started going through the workbooks. I was like, this is not my gig. I, this does not speak to me. I am not going to spend my time listening to 78 cassette tapes that I don't really have that big an interest in. Um, not that I, I have nothing against homeopathy. I think it's great. I think it works. I really admire people who are good at it. So I called the client and I said, you can have all this stuff back. And by the way, you are third generation. And I feel like th it takes that long to be good at this. Would you be willing to work on cases with me? And she said, I am not nearly good enough to do that. And I went, 
Well, if you're not, <laughs> don't look at me. Um, so I have a, a bit of an understanding. There are a few remedies that I know and like and love and will mm-hmm. recommend to people. Um, and then I kind of found Homeopet, and they're a company that does combination remedies with names that are really easy to understand, travel anxiety, joint <laughs> stress. I'm like, oh, I can figure out how to use those. So I do use it, but I, I it's it's not... You don't, delve, <laughs> you don't delve deep. Got it. Got it. Yes. Richard Pitcairn was the first book I read, actually his book. So yeah, <laughs> I was veered in that right. direction, <laughs> but, but it is considered voodoo. It's still considered voodoo by the, by a lot of people. especially the AVMA. Very unacceptable. Um, yeah. Sad. Um, I first learned about you in, I don't know if it was 2015 or 2016. I was at a, a a trade show, a pet trade show. And I was looking for um, standalone products, things that stood out, uh, specifically food, because I believe I'm type one diabetic. I always believe food is the thing that helps us get to the next stage and being better and healthier. So at the time I had at a pet retail store, it was all holistic. I was carrying Evermore and I was looking for something else. So Lo and behold, I hit all provide. And there's a picture of there's the bag on the counter. They had this tiny little table and Dennis, who I love. Um, just starting. <laughs> I mean, they just were starting in the beginning out. stages. <laughs> yep. So I'm looking at the bag, and there's a picture of, of this woman in a white suit who looked like she just came out of a James Bond film. It was you with your hair, and you had this white thing on. And I was like, who's that my god I'm like, da, 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 da. and I mean I'm like I would start to, I would have you know if I knew your name was Judy Morgan I would have sang hey Jude to them or something <laughs> you know so <laughs> so I'm looking at it and then I see the monkey house logo and I started talking to him and that's when I found out about you and I was hooked I mean Dennis was telling me all about you how amazing you are you had formulated that food I'm like this is somebody I want to follow so and I know you're an author, you've written, God, so many books. I have a couple of your books up there, but, um, and you have always been an advocate for pet health. So you've been in veterinary medicine a long time and you have been witness to the evolution of the pet food industry. And with the changes veering toward natural from where you started to the raw movement and now the cooked minimally processed, you even have Mars who just kind of, jumped in and bought nom nom now for a billion dollars. So my, <laughs> I know, I know we can hit that. Um, my question to you is, are we really seeing a healthier pet and are pets living longer now than they were when you first got into practice? Is this, you know, this whole Rodney's book of Forever Dog and you're doing this course, Dog Longevity, what is real? talk about this there's still a lot of early death the cancer numbers are crazy crazy through the roof which is why we did cancer awareness week this week um the cancer numbers are crazy chronic disease is a huge huge problem because even though the raw and natural pet food space i think is the most rapidly growing which is why we're seeing those big companies trying to jump on board and buy up companies that are more geared that way the problem is once they buy them then they make changes to them and then they're not what they were we've seen that for the past 30 years you know a company will start out with all the right ideas trying to be you know one step above and then they they hit the big time whatever and they get bought up by a bigger corporation and then we see changes that's that's just the way it goes because when you when you have to start looking at the bottom line as the main factor instead of, oh, geez, you know, having to say to people, well, this is going to cost you $12 a pound to feed this to your large breed dog. It's going to cost you $20 a day to feed your dog. Um, we know that changes are going to be made to bring that price down. I saw a great cartoon today that said, uh, don't ask why raw food is so expensive. Ask why dry kibble is so cheap. Um, I thought that was the 
I, I have to oh, steal yeah, that. You're talking about cereal versus meat. I mean, there's- <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, grains are cheaper to grow than meat. And we could look at this from the, I, don't, I can't remember what the initial question was, but we, we also, um, you know, if we look at this from an environmental aspect, it takes a lot more resources to grow a cow than the resources it takes to grow grains. Yes. It takes a lot more resources to grow a cow than to grow a chicken, which is why we see so much poultry in mm-hmm. pet food. It's, it's the number one protein source because it's cheaper to grow. You can pack a lot of chickens into a small area. Not that that's a good way to do it, but so, you know, and it's, it's up to every pet parent to make their decision about what they can afford, what they want to do. Um, but so I can tell you that for the pets that I treated that were going down a more holistic path, that were being fed really high quality diets that were limited on their vaccinations or none, um, were not being having chemicals thrown at them, were kept lean weight, were getting mental stimulation. When you put all the puzzle pieces together, yes, those pets are living longer. So in our household, we are a rescue household and we have rescued a ton of puppy mill dogs and those get the worst food, confinement raised in a two by two cage, um, bred to death, no veterinary care, no dental care. I mean, those guys come out of there just absolute train wrecks. And yet, and we have a breed with Cavaliers and English Toy Spaniels, mm-hmm. which are prone to just a boatload of medical problems. And yet the dogs that we're rescuing, and some of them are middle aged, some of them are even in their teens when we adopt them, but they're living to be 17, 18, 19 years old. And I don't think we can say that for the average pet owner who has a dog that's being fed really, you know, bottom of the barrel food, getting vaccinated every year, getting every chemical thrown at them that's being pushed by their veterinarian. So there's a huge difference in how the animals are treated. And the fact that, you know, I can rescue a dog at eight years old who comes with four rotten teeth in his head, horrible arthritis, genetic neurologic diseases and I can get that I can turn that dog around and have that dog live to be 19 years old tells me that it's never too late to start and that we can make significant changes but we have to be willing to to do that um (laughs) so I I think that for those who are taking that more proactive approach we Mm -hmm. are seeing longer lives uh, we're getting great gains that live to be 16, 17. That's wow. kind of unheard of. Most people get six, seven years out of their great gains, mastiffs, cane corsos, you know, the, the bigger breeds. Um, and I can't say that for Bernie's mountain dogs. You can raise them as holistic as you want to, but the genetics in that breed, they're dying at five to seven from their histiocytic sarcoma. And we've got to change up our genetics with those guys. I mean, I, I had a, my, my dog died before he turned 14 and I did everything right, you know, from the beginning. I had him from a puppy. And that happens. <laughs> and, and this, that's where, I, and yes, it happens. It happens. We're living beings. And yes. I've had five-year-old I, dogs die of malignant cancers, dogs that never had a vaccine, fed very high quality foods, um, you know, had active lifestyles with jobs to do. Mm-hmm. Um and we can still, and that's very difficult for the pet owner who says, I did everything right. And I lost yes. my dog at five. Yeah. And it can, I had another client lost their German Shepherd to osteosarcoma of the jaw, age six, oh. did everything right. They, they, they bought the puppy from a breeder that was a holistic breeder. They were raw fed as puppies and didn't give vaccines. And, and, and there you go. So, and it goes back to what we were talking about in this morning's conversation with Dr. Kendra Pope. We live in a toxic environment. Our water is toxic. Our air is toxic. Our, our furnishings and carpets in our house are true, true. emitting, you know, toxic gases, flame retardants, things that, you know, chemical cleaners that we use in the house. There's so many things that you have to think about. And for and and I kind of hate to bring up all that because it it's, it can paralyze pet owners with fear. Yeah, like, yeah, I just can't do it all. I can't do it all right. What do I? You know, 
you do the best you can and keep your fingers crossed and you hope um, and you make every day count and you you do what matters to you and to your pet. As a matter of fact, tonight on my supporters group, we're going to talk about bucket lists for our pets. <laughs> you know, and maybe you start that bucket list on day one. You bring them home yeah. and go, what? So like, one of the things that I'm doing right now is uh, I'm working with Jack Canfield and I have to make a list of 101 goals, things that I want to accomplish in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Just try to sit down and write 101 goals. It is it's crazy. Difficult. Yes. No, it's no. I, I, I have a coach that I work with who made me do that. It took me eight weeks. Yeah. I couldn't come up with three. Yeah. My and brain went crazy and went stupid. I know. It's it's like I paralyzed in fear. I was like, I, I can't come up with 101. And then I said something to my husband and I said, man, I would love to do that someday. And he goes, did you put it on your list? You know, you oh, don't yeah. think to put it on your list. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. know. Do you think, the, but, but do you think that, you know, this whole, your course and, and the Rodney book and all this, the whole perspective of holistic veterinary med- medicine, do you think it's giving pet owners an unexpected uh, view of what they should, ex- what, what they should be doing if they so, do one thing wrong? Do, do they, yeah. so, do they feel like they're I mean, at fault? I mean, it's polarizing. It is. Uh, so that's a very good question. Is it unrealistic for a pet owner to expect their pet to live to be 17, 18, 19 years old? I mean, for cats, we should be getting early to mid 20s easily. Totally. Um, is it unrealistic to, to want that? No. Is it unrealistic to expect that from every pet? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and <sighs> I hate that I, you're saying I, I don't want people to feel guilty if their pet develops something and, and they can't be saved. I mean, I've got a dog right now who is, I think he's nine. I adopted him at six and he came to me with a heart murmur. He's in stage D heart failure. He's, oh. you know, he was given three months to live 15 months ago. So we're on borrowed time. He's passed his expiration date that was given to him. Um, I'm grateful for that, but I know this dog is not going to be a 16 or 17 year old dog. That's his genetics. Um, so there are some things that we can't control. And that's one of those things that we have to give up in life is that we can't control everything. We have to do the best we can and, uh, set that expectation out there to the universe and say, boy, this is what I'd really like. And just keep visualizing that and hope that you get there. Yeah, giving up the need to control. That's a tough thing for most humans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a tough thing for most humans. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the pet food industry, you talk a lot about pet food. And I love that. <laughs> Can we touch on what's going on in the industry? And you have a company like Mars who just bought, spent a billion dollars uh, for this brand nom nom now and nom nom was i mean they said it they're a data company they weren't really a pet food company but they're spending all this money and they own veterinary clinics and they own labs that is a conflict how it is a pet owner and the general public that loves animals and wants to be part of giving back to communities and, and um, you know, the vegan community, the food industry, all this, this animal loving communities, how do they look at this and say that it's okay? Why would, I mean, I can't imagine going to a clinic that's owned by Mars, buying a food, Royal Canaan, that's owned by Mars, and then having my animal's blood work going to a lab that's owned by Mars. I mean, there's, there's a conflict here. And then your veterinarian prescribes food well, owned and, by Mars or sold well, by Mars. Well, now they can prescribe a homemade food owned by Mars mm, in a vet yeah, clinic. I think that's of. the next next space because that's what pet owners want. Yeah. Well, and veterinarians need a profit center. Pet food's a big, pro- huge profit center. Uh, it, uh, for a veterinarian to spend the time to most veterinarians don't know how to do it, but, you know, they can certainly buy software to do it, but for them to spend the time to make a diet personalized for a pet, 
they will get paid for formulating that diet. Maybe they'll get a couple hundred dollars if they're lucky. And then they're not, they don't have that profit center of the pet parent coming in every month to buy another bag of prescription kibble or another case of prescription cans. Um, but frankly, if your personal physician said to you, wow, your blood work looks a little off. Here, I've got this prescription food that you have to come buy from me every month. And um, you read the ingredients and go, ooh, and it tastes pretty crappy. Um, would you do it? Or would you look at them as, this is absurd. And it's, I don't understand the difference. <laughs> I don't either. Um, this is where I'm confused. And it's very confusing. And I think it's hard for pet owners because for if you if you are not up up to <laughs> up to speed on what is going on in the pet food industry, <clears throat> smaller companies are getting bought out right and left. I mean, mm -hmm. literally in the pet industry news that I get in my inbox every day, there's another company being bought out, whether it's pet supplies, pet food, pet beds, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Yeah. The, the smaller, uh, more natural companies, they start out, they have this great plan and then it gets bought up for a lot of money. I get it. You know, if somebody wants to come by my company and pay me enough money, I'm, I'm probably idealistic enough right now that I wouldn't do it. Um, but, you know, everybody has a price tag and yeah. for the right price tag, would I say, see, I'm going to the farm and, you know, never leaving again. Um, so... I get it. And a lot of these companies that are out there, they are, um, they're starting up with the idea that I'm going to grow this and sell it and, and get yep. the big payday. Yes. Some of them are not as idealistic as we would like to think that they know there's a payday out there. Mm -hmm. And some of them, so they have these, um, uh, I don't know what to call them, but they're groups now. It started, I went to the first one in Texas a few years ago, uh, where if you are a startup or you're an entrepreneur with an idea, you can present your idea and you've got buyers there. And yeah. they might be venture capitalists. They might be private investors. They might be equity. ours yeah. or Purina mm -hmm. or yep. one of the big corporations. And we interviewed a lot of people there and, that had you know new ideas. And some of them were amazing. And we were like, man, I mean, we don't have millions of dollars to invest, but I could definitely get behind this product and promote it and, and be an influencer for that particular thing. Some of the things that I became an influencer for, they got funded by Mars or yep. Purina. And unfortunately, some of them, they're the only ones in the space doing that research or offering that product. And it's like, oh, God, I got to recommend this because it's something that is so useful as a diagnostic tool. But I hate where the money's coming from. But do, do you think by them funding that they're trying to manipulate or manage the way the products are marketed so that it doesn't affect their bottom line with their brands that they want to get out there? Hard to say, um, you know, because it's veterinarians who are, well, pet owners can buy a lot of these diagnostic tests too, um, but then they'll need help from their veterinarians interpreting it. So if it comes back and says, well, your dog needs more fiber in his diet. Well, I guarantee the veterinarian has one for that. And your, your pet needs more meat or protein in his diet. Well, they'll have one with more protein, might be pea protein, but they'll mm -hmm. have one with more protein. Um, so... I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's a huge conflict of interest for a candy company to own or a human food company to be in charge of how our pets eat because we know that a lot, I mean, it, I think a lot of it started because they needed somewhere to put the waste products from the human food industry. It's like, where are we going to put them? Oh, dog food. Well, it's called Cattle sustainability feed. now with the Pet Sustainability Coalition. They, you know, being a part of sustaining the pet industry. <laughs> It's just ugly. I don't know. It's just ugly. It is, but for pet, for the average pet owner, unless you do an internet search, and I've done this over the years a lot, who is the parent company of brand X? Yep. And when you follow it back, a lot of times you'll be shocked and you'll say, mm -hmm. I had no idea this food what has ingredients coming from overseas. 
I'll just leave it at that. I had no idea this company was irradiating their food. I had no idea that, um, you know, whatever. Yeah. I had no idea that that's the parent company. And Mars was the number one pet food sales numbers for last year. Mm-hmm. They have been for years, I think. Um, and some of their brands are not as bad as others, but a lot of their brands are just bottom of the barrel. And the number one seller is bottom of the barrel. It's been found to be tainted with pentobarbital many times. It doesn't get oh. recalled. It's just accepted as normal. I don't accept pentobarbital euthanasia solution and my pet food is normal. It's not normal. Did, I mean, does that mean that they're using meats that are not, I mean, animals that are not supposed to be euthanized yeah. with pentobarbital? Rendered. Rendered. So at the AFCO meeting a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. uh, their, um, their star speaker that, that did the keynote speech yep. was the guy who's head of DARPRO rendering, which is the biggest rendering company in the country. Yep. And in his speech, he said, it is literally impossible to have rendered products not have euthanasia solution in them. It is accepted as acceptable. <laughs> He said it was impossible because they, you know, nobody, nobody checks the animals that are going into rendering. I mean, so pen and barbital doesn't change in the cooking process. It's still there. Excuse the background noise. That's my cat playing with his balls. Um, <laughs> not his <laughs> with balls. Um, <laughs> he has no balls, but so is that, I mean, this has to be a contributing factor to why we have these chronic Ill- illnesses. Oh, yeah. It has to be. No other, I mean, I, I just can't. But. Foods that are highly processed um, with high heat processing. So when you make dried kibble, it goes through an extruder, which is a very high heat process. Mm-hmm. Um, foods that are pretty much devoid of nutrients because they're even the, the grain products where our soil is so depleted in this country that we don't have the nutrients in there, you know, even if it, and like Dr. Pope said today, your apple is supposed to have this many milligrams of vitamin C, but because the soil is so bad that the trees are grown in, the apple doesn't have that anymore. So even if you think you're getting something that's high in vitamin content, probably not. But when so wait a second, under- does that mean our whole world is going to be made up of synthetic vitamins to help us? It is, unless we do something about it. Unless so. We moved to the farm last year. We have 23 mm-hmm. acres and I decided that we were going to be more sustainable. So we have chickens to make our own eggs. They're fed organically, free range, happy chickens. Um, we bought uh, meats to put in our freezer from local farms where they are you know, grass fed, blah, 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 um, happy cows. And then I put in this huge garden so that we could fill our freezer full of veggies and have fresh veggies all summer. It's all great, except the soil here is horrible. It was an old hay farm and nobody had done anything to enhance the soil over the years. So we really struggled with, I mean, we got a freezer full, but we really struggled. And so our goal over the winter is soil enrichment. So unless we can start being a little more sustainable in our growing processes and putting things back (laughs) that we've taken out over the years. um, Yeah. And so and, and so that's the problem with processed pet food. It's, it's cooked at high heats. If it's a kibble that's gone through an extruder, it uh, you know may be made with grains that, or ingredients, whatever the carbohydrate ingredients are that, that are not so great with vitamin mineral content at this point. And so we end up having to add those synthetic vitamins and minerals back in at the end of the process. And you know, unfortunately, the food isn't tested when it comes out at the finished end. And that's why we get things like, oh, look at that. We had all these companies with the vitamin D recall because they had 100 times more vitamin D than they should have. And a bunch of animals had to die of kidney failure before anybody could figure it out and put the two pieces together and blah, blah. Um, so we add in synthetics. And I, I almost feel like it should be a requirement in the pet food industry that every time you make a batch of food, uh, before you can sell any, it needs to be tested to make sure that. Oh, it, please come on! It, yeah, it would cost <laughs> a lot of money. But what we're talking about, you know, it would be it would be hard for the small pet food companies. It would be expensive because it's yes. twenty five hundred dollars to run a batch of food. For these big conglomerates that are making 
billions and billions of dollars. They if they can say to me that even a couple times a year they'll test, they'll randomly test a couple batches. Come on, if you're going to add all those synthetics or test your vitamin mineral mix before you put it in to make mm -hmm. sure that it is what it says it is. That it, oh, and by the way, does it have melamine in it? I mean, you know, <laughs> a lot of problems here. Yeah, I know. I know, but it, it, it's it's humans being human. Stupidity. <laughs> but we do have some good, we do have some good humans. Okay, so let's since we have all these issues with food and the environment and poor soil and cancer and genetics, let's talk about preventive care for pets. Um, insurance companies, more and more insurance companies out there. <laughs> getting into the pet sector you're gonna hit all insurance. the hot buttons <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry thank you um so yeah lots of insurance companies popping up all over the place and price of insurance is now going up too so um and and there's more they're limiting what they're covering so what does preventive care for pets look like when it comes to um how a pet insurance company sees it versus what a general practitioner sees as preventive care versus what a holistic veterinary practitioner sees as preventive care. Cause those are on, they're like very different from one another. Oh, they are. So one of the problems that I have seen, and I think pet insurance can be great. Like my daughter has insurance on her big dog who had to have TPLO surgery. She had to have her tail amputated for a mast cell tumor. I mean, that, that dog, the insurance company, my daughter's like, man, did they lose money on us? <laughs> because that dog, you know, her bills have been $20,000 and, you know, out of pocket for my daughter has been very little uh, in comparison. So it can be very helpful. However, I'm seeing insurance companies with ridiculous requirements. Your dog or cat has to be vaccinated every year for all core vaccines in order for your policy to be in effect. What? Okay, was, well, that was you're just giving fear. them cancer. So great. That's, that, so you're going to pay for the cancer that you're giving them. Thank you very much. Um, so I think for the pet owner who is interested in getting pet insurance, you need to look really hard at the policy and what the requirements are going to be. Most of them, you got a pre-existing condition. So I've got this new puppy that I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, he came with hydrocephalus. His back legs are built by committee. They, they go in all directions. And I mean, he's, he's got some GI issues. He's, just, he's a mess. Um, I can't get insurance for that dog. <laughs> he can't. <laughs> Everything is pre-existing condition. <laughs> He has pre and, and, you know, as a veterinarian, I can't, like, maybe I could sneak him into somebody's office who doesn't really know much about Cavaliers and let them proclaim him healthy. <laughs> but I'm a veterinarian. I'm going to have a hard time getting that line through. So, um, so you have to look at pre-existing conditions. And if you are raising your pet more holistically, you need to also look, does it include any alternative therapies? If my pet has arthritis, my pet tears an ACL, are they going to cover acupuncture? Are they going to cover chiropractic? Are they going to cover cold laser? Are they going to cover the supplements? Um, and if the supplements are pre prescribed by the veterinarian, very commonly, they will accept that and we'll pay for it but it really requires a lot of research on the pet parents part if you're looking and by the way a lot of these big companies that we've been talking about they own pet insurance companies I know. As well. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of times yes they will cover a prescription diet but they won't cover the healthy diet that you want to feed your pet some of them will say if you're making homemade food for your pet your policy is null and void because we can't guarantee that you are getting vitamin mineral content correct. So it really is up to the pet owner to do research. We tried to do this one year in our practice. One of my uh, technicians said, I'll take this on. I'll, I'll do a comparison of the different pet insurance companies and we'll present that to our clients so that they can choose. It's like trying to compare apples to oranges to peaches. You can't, you can't, you, can't. you just have to look at each individual policy. That's hard. So, so does a pet insurance company, I mean, are they, my biggest fear was I got this cat who I got health insurance for. Thank God I adopt, I adopted her 2014, had a full checkup. Nothing was wrong. 
after I get health insurance, I find out that she has nasopharyngeal stenosis, needs to have, <laughs> needs to have stents and blah, 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 blah. Any, anyway, so $90,000 of surgeries later, and I may have paid maybe $900 in Yay, insurance. <laughs> it's like, I was so happy. I was like, woo. And she's alive. She's kicking. She's doing great. But yeah, my biggest fear is that the insurance company is going to say she needs to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I won't. Yeah, I'm done. Mm -hmm. exactly. I am not going to vaccinate her. And yeah. that is and I, gonna... I don't know. Um, and I, again, it would be an individual thing if an insurance company would accept titers. Um, so, and that's where I'm asking about preventive care because a holistic veterinary practitioner it asks their clients to do titers as for, right. for preventive care, whereas a general practitioner come in for vaccines, right. get your checkup and move on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sometimes they miss the urinalysis because they were too busy and they didn't do the urine or the owner didn't bring a pee sample. So they forgot to do it. So that gets missed. A lot of things yes. can get missed if the urine's not done. So, yep. you know, in the pet insurance companies, if they're mandating uh, certain things as preventive care, what, what is what is a pet owner to do? It's a really ugly place we are in. It is. And that's why I say it's so important when you're looking at that policy. Um, so like if you wanted to change companies now, if your company said in order to keep your pet on this policy, you were going to have to show proof that the cat is up to date on vaccinations, you would then have to make a decision. Because if you don't want to vaccinate the cat, which if it's an indoor kitty, why would you do this anyway? And, mm -hmm. and if it's ever had a vaccine, why would you do it again? Um, so you would have to make that decision and then to switch to another pet insurance company going to be really difficult because they're going to see that that company paid out 90 grand. It's going to yeah. be really hard. <laughs> now they might say, okay, we will cover other things. We won't cover anything related to this issue, but let's just say, I mean, the cat had a lot of nasopharyngeal surgery. That's trauma to the area. That's an area that could be set up for a cancer to develop. So let's say you have to switch companies and you find one that doesn't require the pet to be vaccinated. And that com company says, well, we won't do anything related to that prior problem, but then the cat develops a cancer in that area. Is that prior? Is that new? Is that related or unrelated? <laughs> and we don't know. And how do you fight that? I it's mean difficult. Um, uh, if your veterinarian is willing to, you know, so let's just say in this scenario, the cat develops a cancer in that nasopharyngeal area. Um, your oncologist or veterinarian may not believe at all that cancers are secondary to traumas in an area. Mm -hmm. So they may go, yeah, totally unrelated. So it would really depend on who's writing that letter to the insurance company. Hmm. <laughs> So I better have good relationships with veterinary oncologists. Okay. I have some, I have some good relationships there. Um, so this is a process that the pet owner has to really take time and do, and do deep investigative work before they choose the path mm -hmm. of one insurer versus another. Okay. Huh. I know. And everybody hates homework. Yeah, you know, everyone wants it easy, and that's where I guess kibble is uh, the way to go. Well, uh, you know, you buy that 50-pound bag for your chihuahua that lasts all year, and you just dump a little in the bowl. Oh, my God, don't say that. I had a client who told me that once. I just about went through to the roof. I was like, do you know how rancid that food is after three weeks? Do you know how many storage mites are in that food after three weeks? Are you nuts? He's like, oh, it only costs me $12 a year to feed the dog. And I'm like, and this, and we're going back 20 years, but... I, I just about lost it. <laughs> and that's one of my stories that I use a lot when I'm telling people, look, if you are going to insist on feeding dry kibble, you buy a bag that you could go through in three weeks or less. You don't dump it into another container. It has to stay in that bag, rolled up, sealed in the dark, in a cool place, because that lining of the bag is protecting the food. You don't put it in a clear see-through plastic container and the plastics are leaching into the food. Don't go there. <laughs> so if you're going to feed kibble, you buy three weeks worth at a time. That's yeah, that's the way to do it. 
Um, one, one more question for you. I know I've taken up a lot of your time. That's right. Um, so you've retired, right? Uh, sort of. Well, I'm retired from clinical practice. Let's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, if you or your family members go to a vet and you talk about, you know, my vet always asks, what are you feeding? I'm like, raw. Yeah, so I feed raw. Um, and the, my vet's used to kind of have something to say, but they stopped eventually. They've gotten to know me, their relationships built. But at the beginning, before you know, I pushed my way in, they would always have something to say. What should pet owners be saying to their vets when they are challenged about raw feeding? I mean, I had one client come to me and she said, well, I know raw causes salmonella, but my cat skin disorder um, you're saying raw is the best way to go. And I said, oh, like, yeah, raw is the best way to go with this cat. Yes. And it doesn't cause salmonella. So. And it doesn't, and <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you know, obligate carnivore and explained it all. And she, she decided to do raw, but it was with fear and anxiety. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really terrible thing to feel every time you go to feed your pet. So the great thing now is we have so many of these companies that are doing human grade food, gently cooked. So if you are really that afraid of raw, gently cooked, cooked it, it's cooked at low temperatures, some of it's steamed. Um, it's certainly a much, still a much, much better way to go than mm -hmm. dead dry food in the bowl. Um, and it's interesting because when I do do um, virtual consultations and one of the questions we ask in our lead up to it is, uh, do, are you willing to make your own food? Are you willing to feed raw? Do you need something already prepared for you? Um, I call them uh, doggy TV dinners because I it's amazing how many people don't even know how to turn on their oven. I had one woman who said, I guess I could get my neighbor to come over and show me how to turn it on. I went, yeah, let's not bother. <laughs> I said, what if I give you a company that makes like little TV dinners for dogs? All you have to do is uh, warm it up, open it up and feed it to the dog. She's like, oh, that would be great. They make those. <laughs> oh so, um, so there are so many options available for people. Um, I have some clients, like one of my dogs had to go in for ear ablation, ear canal ablation <laughs> surgery. One of my rescues that was just a train wreck. And um, so my husband took him in to drop him off for surgery and he had to spend the night. So I sent him in with freeze dried raw in a baggie because I thought, well, that's not gonna be like raw that has to sit in the refrigerator. And uh, they flipped. They, they asked him what it was and he told them they flipped. They all put on caps, gowns, masks, gloves, and booties. And this is long before COVID, put on all this before they would even touch the dog. And then he couldn't be in the surgical ward. He had to be in an isolation room by himself because he was a raw fed dog. They made my husband come home and get different food. They said, we will take home cooked food. We will not take any raw food. So what I learned from that procedure was if my one of my animals had to go to that clinic, I lied. Yep, he's on home cooked food because that was the only way they were going to get treatment. I mean, there, and there are some clinics and I've given lectures all over the country mm -hmm. and I've had technicians who work in very traditional practices who they are strongly pro raw feeder. And they're like, it is so difficult to work where I work. And I really want to educate the clients and tell them that this would be so much better way to feed their pets, but I can't because we're not allowed to say that. And we're anti raw in the practice. So if, and again, this is where, like you said, you managed to work it out and develop a good relationship with the veterinarian. If you really like the veterinarian in all other aspects um, and you think that you can agree to disagree without having to listen to the lecture. I mean, I had to take one of our dogs on a trip to Canada. He got hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, of course, the one that lived to be 19. Hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in our motor home. So uh, the woman where we were going to speak, she was nice enough to find a veterinarian at that end for me to take him to and get labs and fluids and whatever. And I, I walk in the clinic. Now, I'm so grateful that this guy is willing to see my dog. He doesn't know me from Adam. And I walk in and this huge sign in the exam room 
is all about why you shouldn't feed your dogs raw food and how the AHVMA and AHA have statements against it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I'm not about to tell him what I'm feeding this dog because guarantee you he's going to isolate him for a salmonella or E. coli. And I'm like, I know that's not our issue. Um, so, and I was just grateful that he was willing to treat my pet and I just wasn't going to open that can of worms. Uh, so it's really up to you. If you have- better- This information is dangerous. It's oh, misinformation it is. and it, it, it can actually wind up hurting animals. Oh, it does. Who, who need absolutely to go does. that route. It absolutely does. And that's where I think we're very polarized. Uh, pet owners go in angry to their vets and the vets are frustrated by pet owners. And it's become this, you know, push pull. Yep. And that polarization is unhealthy for both sides. It is. And so one of the things, um, the, and I have a couple of blogs on how to find the right veterinarian. And I've done mm-hmm. quite a few uh, Facebook live videos and they're probably on YouTube now. Yeah, too. I'll put a link on, I'll, on I'll how to find a veterinarian that you can work with. And actually in the book that I'm working on now, if I ever get it finished, um, there's a big thing in there about how to interview a veterinarian, how to find a veterinarian, how to get along with your veterinarian. If you're in an area where there's only one practice within a 50 mile radius, you're kind of stuck. You're going to have to figure out how to work it out. Even if that means that you don't tell them that you're feeding raw. Um, but there's, there's a match for everybody out there somewhere. And you need to not have an angry relationship with your veterinarian. And if you are butting heads, that's not going to be good for your pet. There's just anxiety surrounding them every time you have to do anything. Uh, So it it is really important to figure out how to have a conversation where you can have mutual respect. And part of that is not backing your veterinarian into a corner. They have the beliefs they have because that's what they were taught. That's what they're told. That is what rains down on them from all sides. So it really is a matter of respecting them and saying, this is the path that I've chosen for my pet. Look, I really, I don't believe in over vaccinating my pet. I don't believe in using all these chemicals on my pet. So, you know, it's like when, when I used to have a doctor in New Jersey that every time I went in for anything, he gave me the list of vaccines he wanted me to get, you know, the whooping cough and the flu and the, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And Every single time I would say, look, you know, I don't do that stuff. You know that I'm a holistic person. He goes, yeah, but it's my job to inform you. And I have to tell you, and I have to give you these written handouts. And I said, you do understand where these are going to end up. And it's kind of a waste. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have to give them to you. And I would just say, okay, thank you. And then I would leave them on the front desk on my way out. But we disagreed that we would disagree. And I understood that it was his job to try to educate me and tell me what was from his standpoint is what the medical groups believe. So if a technician comes in to the room with your pet at the veterinary office and they start going over, you know, different vaccines, heartworm preventative, deworming, whatever, my advice is listen politely and say, thank you very much for giving me that information. I'll go home and think about it. Or, you know, I'm, I'm going to decline it for today because my technicians, if they went over things and the client said, yeah, we're not doing any of that, they would say, okay, but it's my job to have to tell you that. And if I don't tell you that I'm in trouble with the boss. So I'm just giving you this information. You can do with it, whatever you want. And so my technicians knew how to have that conversation and not get backed into a corner and, you Mm -hmm. know, but we were a more holistic practice anyway, but, um, so it really is a matter of, of being polite and respectful to them, but then holding your own ground and saying, yeah, I'm going to do it this way. Thanks for the information. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that a little more. Yeah, I mean, you can do with it what you want. You don't have to look into anything. Um, but, um, you know, just respect where they're coming from because, and they are all frustrated right now and shorthanded and it's terrible. Yeah. Um, and it's like I feel guilty for not it's practicing. <laughs> And it's all they know and they don't want, and they're frustrated with people constantly Dr. Googling and, and going over their heads. It's just yeah. undermining. I, I know that I am the knowledge. bane of a lot of veterinarians <laughs> because people go, well, Dr. Judy says, and that's fine. <laughs> that is true. It's funny. I was sitting in an animal medical center and my cat was being brought out to me and her vet, who is, you know, the surgeon for, um, her stenosis. He, uh, he had a client in the room with him and they were talking about 
Gene Dodds. And he was ripping her apart. I'm like, shoot, I got to go into that room after him and just be like, you need to have an open mind, think a little differently. And I'm trying to be, and I'm thinking what I'm going to say to him. So their view on food was changed and they actually walked out with a prescription diet as opposed to what they had learned from Dr. Gene Dodds. So when I went in there, it was hysterical. I said, you know, you know you, you, uh, your way isn't the only way. And he said, what do you mean? And I explained to him the conversation that I heard. And he said, well, she's a quack. And I, I said, oh, and you're so amazing. Maybe you can learn something from her. Maybe. Well, he was- Karen, Becker, Karen Becker and Gene Dodds and I, we've been called quacks a lot of times. Uh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know because you stand up for something different. And when you look at the world a little differently than the status quo, you're going to be shut down for it. And I'm grateful that you do because you've educated so many people to do better and be better for the sake of their animals. So thank you for doing this. I am so grateful that you agreed to do this segment with me. Thank you. Not a problem. You're amazing. You're amazing. And, uh, you have the cancer, you have the dog longevity made easy. It's $29, right? It's yeah, it's a, it's a short course. Um, if And we have longer stuff in the works, mm-hmm. but we wanted something that was really simple and easy that um, affordability wouldn't be a big issue for most people so that, you know, they could, they could get that information in a simple, it doesn't require you to sit in front of your computer for six hours. It literally is like an hour and a half, but it's uh, <laughs> six segments maybe. Um, so, and it just, it's, it gives you more confidence and a little bit of fuel when you are going in to make those decisions, it gives you, gives you that um, confidence to stand your ground and say, no, like I understand what can go wrong here. And so I'm choosing, again, thank you for educating me. I will take that into consideration. I'm going to do it this way. Um, (laughs) I'll think about it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Another thing that I've had a lot of pet parents do, my book, Needles to Natural, which Mm -hmm. was written back in 2014. So some of the stuff in there, I would change now if I rewrote it, because there are some food brands in there that I talked about at the time, which I would not feed now. Um, But I've had a lot of people buy that book for their veterinarian and say, why don't you read this? And it has actually changed a lot of veterinarians. Like people have come back to me and said, my vet actually read it and now is starting to utilize some of that stuff. That's great. That's amazing. Yep. More of that is needed. And the yin and yang nutrition for dogs, which is Mm -hmm. a cookbook for different um, disease problems. I give that to a lot of people who. Yeah. Well, that is now being sold in a lot of veterinary offices, which Mm -hmm. is very cool that, and it's, I mean, clearly it's holistic veterinarians, but it's somebody who's willing to say, yeah, we're not going to go with dead food in a bag. We're we're here. You can do this. Like we're going to make it simple for you. It's amazing. Um, Question, quick question. Are you going to do kitty longevity course? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Kitty longevity. It's, it's on my little list of things right here on my computer. <laughs> um, yeah. And that one should be pretty quick, but we are also, um, another thing that I have to work on for a summit that's coming up that I believe Odette Suter is putting on, um, is on isoxazoline detox and alternatives for flea and tick prevention. Mm-hmm. So I've got to put that one together. Um, and we still need that. We do. we're having uh, dental health week. So we did cancer awareness week this month. Next month is dental health week. The month after that, we're doing kidney health. And then we're also putting together a, a big course on hospice and palliative care. And I'm doing that one um, with my co-author, Michelle Allen from Monkey's House, Monkey because House. she has saved hundreds of dogs that have death sentences um, and uh, brought them into monkey's house. And so she's got so many tips and tricks. And, um, uh, so we're putting that one together. That one will be a big one. That's probably going to be a 20 to 30 hour course. 
So it's going to be for people who really want the deep dive. So rescues that are doing hospice and palliative care work, veterinarians or technicians that are doing hospice and palliative care work. But even the pet owner who says, look, I've got, you know, these old dogs or cats and mm -hmm. I want to be able to keep them alive. I want to keep them comfortable. I need to know those tricks of the trade. Um, and to cost savings also for the pet owner when they know the what run. to do and what yeah. questions to ask, yep. they will yep. save money. Yeah. If you know how to do sub-Q fluids at home and don't have to go to your veterinarian three times a week, there's a huge savings. If you know, uh, you know how to deal with your brittle diabetic uh, mm -hmm. without having to run into the emergency, if you know how to make a, a quick oxygen cage at home for very little money, it might save you that emergency trip with your dog that has a heart issue that, you know, you've seen this many times and basically they end up at the clinic sitting in oxygen. All, I mean, I lost one of mine that we had to take her in to be in oxygen and um, they did not give the food, the, give the dog any fluids or any nutrition oh for 48 hours. She died. <gasps> it was, it was the worst case of malpractice and I will never ever drop one of my dogs off and leave them in somebody else's care again. Never. Oh my God. And this is coming from a veterinarian who knows her shit. Yeah. You know, and I didn't and sue them because just... I, I am, you know, an equal in the field. Um, and I didn't want to do that, but man, I, I was, it was years ago. I was so angry, so angry. And I didn't even badmouth them online. I told the story at the time, but I didn't tell the clinic, you know, I didn't name the clinic. Um, but I would, I would never recommend one of my patients do that. So that's one of the things with Michelle with Monkey's House. She uh, absolutely, she said a dog will die at home in my arms before it will be dropped off in a cold steel cage somewhere with people who don't know it and don't care. Or if they do care, they're too busy to, to deal with it. Um, She's amazing. She is amazing. And that's why I think this course is so important because people, again, need that empowerment to know what to do um how to do it and when and like yes. we we even have with monkey's house one of the things we had to do we had to set up criteria what what is criteria for euthanasia versus natural death a lot oh of people God. Are that's such a, a lot great of people subject yeah a lot of people are not comfortable with natural death um and they don't want their animal to have one breath of discomfort um but we actually at the very beginning of monkey's house michelle and i sat down and we made the criteria of when we would have to get emergency euthanasia, which she's very lucky. She has people that can come to the house to do it. Um, but, you know, if not, and she had an animal in situation X, Y, we only have three criteria. It, the animal is in situation X, Y, or Z. That would mm -hmm. be the only time when we would consider getting in to a clinical setting for emergency euthanasia. So... And even at that point, you can be there with the animal. You can hold the animal. You, you well, should be. You there's, there's this whole COVID curbside thing. Oh, well, now I, another, I'm, that's another I'm very lucky. One. Yeah, I'm very lucky. I, 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 I have veterinarians who will allow me in, um, yeah. but not everyone has that. Exactly. So that, that's, that's very hard. difficult. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, my God. That it sounds like an amazing course. I'm going to take that course. <laughs> I have a lot to learn. Thank you so much. You're amazing. I, I adore you. I adore you. you and what you do. You're thank the best. You. I'm, I'm thankful that there are people like you that are spreading the word because I have my group that I reach. It's building. But um, every time we do something like this, we reach more people. Yep. And, you know, it's kind of that whisper down the line. Like I tell one person, they tell six people, each of those people tell six people. And that's how we're expanding. So and I hope you keep growing and I will always be following you Thank from you. needles to natural, you know, yang. I mean, great, great books, author, veterinarian, check Dr. Judy out. Um, I will have a link to your site and you. to your courses. And I'm excited. Thank you so much. Thank you.